Good afternoon, y'all, and welcome to this latest reading of our uh, Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Af Africa, uh, Chapter 4, Section 3. We'll be starting from uh, Part C of Section 4.3 today. And as always, thank you to those who have joined us in the live Discord. If you are in the live Discord, as always, you can find the uh, PDF in the PID section of the Discord. Thank you for following along on YouTube as well, if that's how you happen to be following along. If that's where you're watching, you can go ahead and find the same PDF as long with any um, articles that we happen to reference if we do in the description. Um, without any further note, uh, ado, uh, let's get started with um, Chapter 4.3, Section C, The Eastern and Stream States. In an earlier discussion, attention was directed to Bunyoro Katara as the most advanced socio-political formation in East Africa up to the 15th century. Its ruling dynasty, the Bakwazi, uh, declined for reasons that are not clear, and they were overwhelmed by new immigrants from the north. While there is some doubt as to whether the Bakwazi had an Ethiopian origin, it is clearly established that the 15th century immigrants peoples from a section of the Nile that flows through the Sudan. Following upon Luo migrations, a new line known as the Babito dynasty was placed in power over Benyoro proper. Other branches of the same dynasty were enthroned in several places, sometimes breaking off from the main line. As late as the 19th century, a separate Babito kingdom was carved out in Tordo. Meanwhile, the Bakwazi or Bahima had staged a comeback in regions to the south in the form of a clan known as the Bahinda. The Bahinda was one of the pastoralist clans of the old Benyoro Katara state. And, uh, and in the period from the 16th century onwards, their stronghold was in Nkole and Karagwe. Obviously, the new Babito ruling class immediately sought to take control of the land. But in accordance with settled African customs, they later tried to project themselves as the original owners of the land, rather than usurpers. In Busaga, where there were several small Bito kings, a researcher reported the following dialogue about land between a member of a royal clan and a common royal clan member. We found this place empty and made something of it. You fellows later came around begging for land, so we were generous and gave you some. Naturally, you're now our slaves. Commoner, oh ho, what a lie. We were here long before you. You took your power by trickery. You princes have always been scoundrels. At no stage in the independent history of these interclustering states did uh, land become purely a personal possession to be monopolized by a given class, as in the classic European feudal model. Scholars frequently demand this future before they concede that feudalism has arrived. But they fail to take into account the reality of the distribution and use of fruit or produce of the land in the hands of a few. And they fail to realize that where cattle were a dominant form of wealth, then private ownership of herds were also part of a process by which producers were separated from the means of production. To be specific, those who owned the herds were usually the behenda or other Bahima, or the new Babito families. While those who tended them were clients and virtually serfs of the owners, as far as land was concerned, the peasant who farmed it paid a heavy tax in crops to the clan lands and ruling authorities to allow the latter to live without resort to agricultural work. It is necessary to recall that in the process of independent evolution on all continents, the increase in productive capacity was accompanied by increasing inequality at all stages except socialism, to say that the uh, Lekestrian zone continued developing inter uninterruptedly up to the eve of colonialism is to highlight the expanded productive capacity of the states and at the same time to recognize, frankly, that it was the result of increased exploitation, not only of natural resources, but also of the labor of the majority. The latter were disenfranchised and oppressed to get them to toil in the interest of a few who lived in palaces. The inner Lacustrian kingdoms fell mainly in what is now Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. 
only in the northeast of Tanzania are there representatives in the inner Livingstonian complex of states. Northeast Tanzania was the most developed portion of the country in the pre-colonial epoch because the rest of mainland Tanzania compromised or comprised uh, numerous uh, small kingdoms that had not decisively left behind the communal stage. But Northeast uh, Tanzania was also the corner of the country in which problems arose when a new ideology of egalitarianism was being preached after the end of the colonial era. Because there was already a regime of inequality in the distribution of land and produce and in the rights granted to individuals, in fact, in any meaningful political sense, the area was feudal. There is some disagreement as to the origins of the important lacustre state of Buganda. Some traditions give it the same Luo origin as Banyura, while others tend to hold that it was a Bakwazi survival. Its social structure certainly paralleled that of Babito Banyolo closely, unlike in Ankole. In Buganda, the Bahima did not have the range of political power. They were only associated with the cattle only ruling class, very often in the junior capacity of herdsmen. In any event, uh, Uganda's history was one of gradual expansion and consolidation at the expense of Banyero and other neighbors. But by the 18th century, it had become the dominant power in the whole region. Uh, hey Zoe, could you look in general chat and take care of Jamie? Thank you. Uh, the Buganda state had a, a sound agricultural base uh, with bananas as a staple and with cattle uh, products being available. Their craftsmen, give me a second. Their craftsmen manufactured bark cloth for export, and local production of iron and pots was supplemented by imports from, uh, from neighboring African communities. Uh, their lack of salt was a big stimulus to the extending of their trade network to obtain the necessary supplies, and as was true of the western. Uh, Sudan, such an extension of the network of commerce was in effect integrating the productive resources of a large area. Carl Peters, the advanced agent of German colonialism in East Africa, remarked that in estimating the political and commercial affairs of East Africa, too little stress is laid uh, on this internal trade among the tribes. The barter trade of Buganda defies all direct calculation. In Buganda's case, the absence of slave trading must have been important in expanding internal production and trade, and therefore providing a sound base for the political superstructure. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, the kings of Buganda set up a small permanent armed force, which served as a bodyguard, and the rest of the national army was raised when necessary. The political administration uh, was centralized under the Kabaka, um, and district rulers were appointed by the Kabaka and his council rather than left to be provided by the clans on a hereditary family basis. Great ingenuity went into the went into devising plans for administering uh, this large kingdom through a network of local officials. Uh, perhaps the best tributes to the political sophistication of Buganda came from the British. When they found Buganda and other East African feudalities in the 19th century, they were the best tributes because they were reluctantly extracted from white racist and culturally arrogant colonialists who did not want to admit that Africans were capable of anything. Actually, Europeans were so impressed with what they saw in the inner like extreme zone uh, that they invented the thesis that th those political states could not possibly have been the work of African and must have been built at an earlier date by white Hamites from Ethiopia. God damn, their chauvinism knows no bounds, does it, y'all? This myth seemed to get some support from the fact that the Bekwazi were said to have been light-skinned. However, in the first place, had the Bekwazi come from Ethiopia, they would have been black or brown Africans. And secondly, as noted earlier, the cultures of East Africa were synthesis uh, of local developments, plus African contributions from outside to specific localities. They were certainly not foreign imports. Assuming that the Bakwazi or Bahima were from Ethiopia, then they lost their language and became Bentos of peace, um, speaking like their subjects. The, the same thing happened to the Babito dynasty of Luo extraction, indicating that they had been absorbed by the local culture. 
Furthermore, the Babito and the Behima Behenda also forged close connections from the 16th to the 19th centuries. In effect, out of different ethnic groups, caste and classes, a number of nationalities were emerging. The nationality group is held to be that social formation which immediately precedes the nation state and the definition applies to the peoples of Uganda, Benirdo and Kole, Kalegre and Toro, as well as to those in Rwanda and Burundi. Okay. We can pause for discussion for a second. So it's, 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 it's interesting how he's in the picture of like how these uh, folks even necessarily like relate themselves uh, to the land, talking about these like colonizing folks, the Europeans. He's talking about this idea that they are already projecting like Western chauvinism onto like Africans' relationship with Africa. Um, the idea that like Africans cannot produce uh, anything beautiful is like something that they seem to be uh, interested in spreading the idea that you know it must have been white or at the very least much lighter skinned uh, Africans uh, is something unfortunately that you hear all the time but he's uh, rotten he's letting it be known that cultures of East Africa Africa was synthesis of local developments and uh, plus African contribution contributions from outside the specific localities were definitely not foreign imports. Uh, they theorized that it must have been some white Hamites that built some of the structures um, in the Lacustrine zone. And he's just straight up letting us know that like, that doesn't even seem to be possible or hold up to any kind of material reality when you look on the face of it. So these Europeans, they're not only racist, but they're culturally arrogant. Uh, and I think that's even a term he uses, actually. He says they're culturally arrogant colonialists uh, who do not want to admit that Africans were capable of anything. So we got to always keep in mind, like, the way history gets framed is, is oftentimes from a colonizer's lens, not necessarily from any kind of material lens. Uh, so we got to make sure that we keep that in mind. Uh, hey, Jamie, thanks for joining us, comrade. We're on section 4.3, and we're and in that section. We're on, we're about to start part D, which is Rwanda. So I'll give you some time while we continue the discussion. Uh, so the nationality group is, is held for the social formation, which immediately precedes the nation state and the division and the definition applies to the peoples of Buganda, Banyolo, and Kole, Kaolagre, and Tolo, as well as to those of Rwanda and Burundi. So he and we and it's, it's a thing throughout how Europe underdeveloped Africa that he's setting up this he's putting this idea in our heads that there are diverse groups even within regions, you know, let alone across the whole of Africa. You know, you can't Think of Africans as any one monolith who completely even look the same, let alone have the same cultural attitudes. And this this definitely holds up to um, the analysis, even when you look today across the diaspora and you um, and you meet one African from another. There are light skinned Africans and dark skinned Africans and Africans from all kinds of regions who have all kinds of different beliefs and spiritual practices, you know, so we got to keep this in mind and don't not give way to chauvinistic European centric, uh, uh, chauvin, uh, um, uh, propagandizing about Africans. So that's very important. Hey, Jamie, good to have you here, comrade. So, uh, let's continue starting with Rwanda. Uh, part D of section 4.3. The westernmost portion of the inner Lekastrian zone comprised the kingdoms of Rwanda and Burundi. The two countries which today bear those names are centered around the old kingdoms. The, experience, the experiences of Rwanda will be instanced here. Like the old Banyoro Katara kingdom and like its northeastern neighbor state in Nkole, Rwanda was split into two major social groups. 
Though the great majority of the population were cultivators known as the Bahutu, the uh, political power was in the hands of Batutsi uh, pastoralists, comprising about 10% of the population. An even smaller minority were the Batwa, about 1%, who were at a very low level of pre-agricultural social organization. The relative physiques of the uh, three social segments of Rwanda, uh, well, in Rwanda, offers an interesting commentary on the development of human beings uh, as a species. The Batutsi are one of the tallest. Uh, the Batutsi are one of the tallest human groups in the world. Um, the Bahutu are short and stocky, and the Batwa are pygmies. The differences can be explained largely in terms of social occupation and diet. Mm. The Batwa were not living in settled agricultural communities. Instead, they wandered around in small bands, hunting and digging um, roots, thereby failing to assure themselves of plentiful or rich food. Uh, at the other extreme, the Batutsi pastoralists were subsisting on a, a constantly accessible and rich diet of milk and meat. Um, the Bahutu were more socially advanced than the Batwa. They ate more and regularly. Uh, they ate more and more regularly than the latter because Bahutu agriculture meant they did not uh, live entirely on the whims of nature, following scarce game like the Batwa. However, the quality of their food fell short of the protein-rich Batutsi diet. Thus, the development of man, the physical being, is also linked in a broad sense to the expansion of productive capacity and the distribution of food. In any event, it was their political and military achievements rather than their height which distinguished the Batutsi from a historical standpoint. Their contribution to the Kingdom of Rwanda goes back to the 14th century to a period contemporaneous, contemporaneous with the Bekwazi. Uh, hey there, Archer. Um, thank you for joining us, comrade. We're on section. Uh, we're on chapter four, section um, three, and we're in part D, which is the Rwanda part of that section. If you want to, if you want to follow along, you can find the PDF in the pen section. Uh, there were indeed striking parallels and actual links between Rwanda and Nkoli, and between Kabagwe and Burundi. But unlike Bunyoro Katala, Rwanda in the 14th and 15th centuries was far from being a single political entity. There were several small chiefdoms, and there was the expansion of a central Rwanda Tutsi clan, which gradually created a small, compact state in the 17th century. Later still, that central Rwanda state extended its frontiers, and it was still doing so when the colonialists arrived. For instance, rulers in Pororo and Kole was already, were already paying tribute to Rwanda, which was growing at Nkole's expense. At the head of the Rwanda kingdom was the Mawame. Like so many other African rulers, his powers were sanctioned by religious beliefs and his person surrounded by religious ritual. Feudal kings in Europe often tried to get their subjects to believe that royal authority emanated from God and that the king therefore ruled by the divine right. Subjects of African kings like those of the Moami of Rwanda often accepted something quite close to that proposition. Of course, in addition, the authority of the king had to be based on real power and the Moami of Rwanda did not overlook that fact. Rujugira uh, was a famous Moami of the 18th century, and the last of the independent line was a uh, ruler of Agiri, um, known as Kegiri IV, who died in 1895. Uh, Gehindiro is another whose praises were sung by the court musicians and historians. Each of them was associated with one or more contributions to refining and elaborating the power structure of the state which meant that they each embodied certain historical class and national forces. The Moami Rujagera in the 18th century took the step of placing his frontier zones under the exclusive authority of a military commander and stationing strong contingents of soldiers there. The move was significant because in any young um, and growing state, the most uncertain areas are those on the frontiers, known as the marcher provinces in European feudal terminology. Ruzhu Gerda was in fact placing the marcher provinces under military law, and he also put permanent military camps at strategic places. Early in the 19th century, Moami Gehendero overhauled the civil uh, administration. In each province, there was created both the land chief and the cattle chief, 
one um, being responsible for farm rents and the other for cattle dues. Besides, there were smaller district authorities or hill chiefs within all the provinces, all members of the uh, Batutsi aristocracy. Whether by accident or design, it turned out that administrators responsible for different areas and different matters were uh, jealous of each other, and that kept them from uniting to conspire against the Moana. The hill chiefs were for a long time hereditary, but then given the uh, Batutsi means, uh, clans or lineages, lineages. But under Rawa Bagheri, they became uh, appointed under another move which strengthened central government. Meanwhile, the civil uh, servants and counselors, collectively known as Beru, were given um, grants of land, which were from the intervention of the land and cattle, thereby cementing the uh, loyalty of the Beru to the throne. Um, the system of social relations which emerged in Rwanda were more completely hierarchical and feudal than in most other parts of Africa. Hierarchy and social uh, legal interdependence of classes and individuals with futures found in the army, the civil administration, and in the social fabric itself. The key to everything else was the control over cattle through an institution known as Ubuhaki. This meant that the poor in cattle and those of a low status by birth could approach anyone with more cattle and more respected status and offer his physical labor services in return for cattle and protection. The cattle were never given as outright property, but only the usufruct was handed to the client. Therefore, the client could have the use of the cattle for so long as he reciprocated by handling over milk and meat to his overlord, and for so long as he remained loyal. Of course, the peasant on the land also had to perform labor services and provide tribute in the form of food. The Batutsi aristocracy fulfilled their function of offering protection, partly by making uh, representations at the Mawami's court or by defending uh, their dependents in legal cases. Uh, above all, however, the protection came through specialization in the military art. Ever since the 15th century, there was compulsory military service for certain but uh, Tutsi lineages. Sons of the Batutsi aristocracy became loyal pages, receiving all their educational training within the military context. Uh, each new Moami made a fresh recruitment to add to uh, existing forces. Uh, Zoe posts the definition of usufruct, or usufruct, how you pronounce it, in the chat, which is the legal right of using and enjoying the fruits or profits of something belonging to another. Uh, how they legally justify imperialism, huh? The right to use or enjoy something. Okay. Thank you, Zoe. That's really important to know. Some, some Bahatu were associated with uh, particular regiments to provide supplies, and the Batwa were also incorporated as specialist archers with poison arrows. Of course, the protection which the Batutsi gave the Bahatu was a myth in the sense that they were guarding that what they were guarding was their exploitation of the Bahatu. They defended um, them from external enemies so that the population became dense and plentiful. They conserved the Bahatu so that the latter could exercise their highly developed agronomical knowledge to produce surplus. Furthermore, the top stratum of Batutsi were the cattle owners, and they left their cattle to the lesser Batutsi to land, thereby exploiting the labor and profound empirical knowledge which the common cattle herders possessed. As in Europe and Asia, such was the socioeconomic base which supported a life of leisure and intrigue among the Batutsi aristocracy. There was little intermarriage between Batutsi and Bahutu, and hence they are regarded as caste. The Batwa too can be similarly categorized, but since the caste were hierarchically uh, placed one over the other, it was a situation of class and there was upward and downward mobility from one class to another to a certain extent. At the same time, Batutsi, Bahutu, and Batwa together uh, evolved as the Rwanda um, together evolved as the Rwanda nation, having common interest to defend even against against even the Batutsi, Bahutu, and Batwa, who comprised the kingdom of Burundi. The people of Rwanda were not unique in developing a state and a sense of national consciousness, while at the same time experiencing the rise of more sharply differentiated classes and caste in society. The important thing is that they were free to develop relatively unaffected by alien influence, and certainly free from direct ravages of slave trading. All right, so that wraps up.
section D, which was uh, the Rwanda section. And there's quite a lot to say um, from that section before we wrap up with uh, section E. Let's pause for discussion and that, with that in mind. So looking back at it, he's making distinctions even between there's different cultures even within a region. Um, something we briefly mentioned a little bit earlier. So he's talking about this idea. Where is it? Uh, where is this quote up here? The contribution to the kingdom of Rwanda goes back to the 14th century to a period contemporaneous with the Bakwazi. There were indeed striking parallels and actually an actual links between Rwanda and Ankole and between Kabargwe and Burundi. But unlike Banyuro Katara, Rwanda in the 14th century, 15th century was far from being a single political entity. There are several small chiefdoms, and it was the expansion of a central Rwandi Tutsi clan which gradually created a small compact state in the 17th century. Later still, that central Rwanda state um, extended its frontiers, and it was still doing so when the colonialists arrived. Whereas this rulers in Empororo um, uh, and Kole were already paying tribute to Rwanda, which was growing at Kole's expense. He's talking about this idea that even within a nation, there could be a nation. So the, this African concept of a nation within a nation that pops up uh, all over Africa when you uh, take a look at some of the stuff he's talking about throughout Europe under developed Africa. He's making all these different agricultural distinctions, talking about uh, making distinctions between agricultural economies and dis- industrial economies. He was saying here, quote, the Batwa were not living in settled agricultural communities. Instead, they wandered around in small bands, hunting and digging fruits, thereby failing to assure themselves a plentiful were rich food. At the other extreme, the Batutsi pastoralists were were subsisting on constantly accessible and rich diet of milk and meat. The Bahutu were more socially advanced than the Bawa. They ate more and more regularly than the latter because Bahutu agriculture meant they did not live entirely on the whims of nature, following scarce game like the Bawa. However, the quality of their food fell short of the protein-rich Batutsi diet. Uh, Thus, the development of man, the physical being, is also linked in a broad sense to the expansion of productive capacity and the distribution of food. So even within this um, relatively um, close uh, cultures, there's even a distinction in like how they go about uh, food consumption. You know, one is having to necessarily live uh, off the land and uh, live off the agriculture, uh, as he refers to with the whims of nature. Uh, the other is falling short of a protein-rich diet uh, and is more into having to uh, hunt uh, for their food, not necessarily uh, farming and such, such. So that's extremely important, this idea that uh, the way they even went about hunt, um, getting food uh, being the same isn't something that went into um, reality. Like oftentimes, whenever African media is being portrayed, it's all it's never us. It's never portraying us living off the land. It's always like you know um, tribes hunting um, game and whatnot, and typically big game too. Never anything small. That's probably uh, on purpose. Uh, trying to trying to like kind of paint this idea that like we didn't even have any versatility in our diet that it was all just meat basically all protein which is just a little ahistorical to say the very least he says the relative physiques of the social of the three social segments of rwanda offers an interesting commentary on the development of human beings the batuti are one of the tallest human groups the bahutu are short and stocky and the bakwa are pygmies the differences can be explained largely in terms of social occupation and diet. So yeah, even like physical discrepancies end up coming into place quite literally based off um, how these folks relate to production uh, from a food standpoint. You know, so we gotta we gotta take um, into account like the real material uh, reality that goes into like how Africans quite literally develop both socially and. Um, and even physically. So that's a super important thing. Did anybody else have a point they wanted to bring up before we move on to section E or discuss or say anything? 
not an issue. Uh, this was another point I wanted to talk about before we uh, move on. At the head of the Rwanda kingdom was the Moami. Like so many other African rulers, his powers were sanctioned by religious beliefs and his powers surrounded by religious ritual. Feudal kings in Europe often tried to get their subjects to believe that royal authority emanated from God and that the king therefore ruled by divine right. Subjects of African kings like those of the Moami of Rwanda often accepted something quite close to that proposition. Of course, in addition, the authority of the king had to be based on real power and the Moami of Rwanda did not overlook that fact. So, even though, like, something close to, like, the divine right of kings exists on the motherland, he's saying that there's still the understanding that, like, that has to be backed up by something real, something tangible, something that uh, people can perceive, you know, in, in the material sense and not only in the spiritual sense. So, uh, I don't think he gets too much into how kings would... Uh, uh, assert their authority in a material way, but he's definitely um, alluding to the idea that that would happen. Uh, so we got to understand that they weren't just like calling on um, the gods or um, just a spiritual relation to rule, but also in a material way as well. So that's extremely important. Yeah, just, that was a good section. Uh, I believe section E, which is what we're about to start, that's the last section, and it's a bit longer. But after that, we'll be ready to move on to 4.4 next week. So let's get started. Uh, section E, which is Amazulu. So the same freedom from slave trading was operational in South Africa. For West African uh, exports of capotes, uh, began in Angola and East African exports came from Mozambique and zones further north. The area sort, uh, south of the Limpopo uh, was one that has some of the simpler social formations in Africa up to the 15th century. The eastern side was sparsely peopled up to a late date by the Khoikhoi herdsmen who were slowly edged out by Bantu speakers. When European ships uh, touched out, touched on the natal coast in the 16th century, it was still a region of widely scattered um, homesteads. But in the years to come, the population became denser and important political military development took place. Anyone with a nodding acquaintance with the African past would have heard the name of Shaka, the Zulu who um, most embodied the social and political changes which took place in the eastern portion of South Africa. One biographer, a European, had this to say of Shaka. Napoleon, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, Hannibal, Charlemagne. Such men as these have arisen periodically throughout the history of the world to blaze a trail of glory that has raised them above the common level. Such a man was Shaka, perhaps the greatest of them all. The above praise song appeared on the back cover of the biography in question. And since capitalist publishers treat books just like boxes of soap powder, one is admittedly to be suspicious of any advertisement designed to sell the book. Nevertheless, all commentators on Shaka, both African and European, frequently compare him favorably with the great man of European history. It is therefore appropriate to examine Amazulu society up to the 19th century with a view to understanding the role of the leader uh, in the relationship to the development of society as a whole. Shaka was born about the year 1787. And the impressive achievements attributed to him in his 40-year uh, lifespan can only be briefly enumerated here. By 1816, he had a small, he was a head of a small uh, Amagnoni uh, clan, the Amazulu. Within a year, uh, within a few years rather, he had reorganized it militarily, both in terms of weapons and the tactics and strategy of war, uh, so that the Amazulu clan became a, a feared fighting force. Through warfare and political uh, maneuvering, he united and commanded the uh, Amarioni, who had previously been divided into dozens of independent or semi-independent clans. At one point, it seemed as though Shaka was about to unite under one rule the whole of the region that is now NATO, uh, Lesotho and Swaziland. That task was not accomplished when he met his death in 1828. 
nor were his successors able to maintain Shaka's sway. But the territory belonging to the Amazulu Nation in the late 19th century was 100 times greater than the 100 square miles of the original patrimony of the Amazulu clan, as inherited by Shaka in 1816. It was a diminished and less powerful Amazulu that was still capable of 1876 of inflicting upon the British one of the most crushing defeats in their history of overseas adventuring at the Battle of uh, Sandawana. Shaka grew up at a time when the questions of unity and of effective armies were being posed seriously for the first time among the Amanioni. Uh, previously, the clans, which generally coincided with chiefdoms, displayed a tendency to segment or break into smaller and smaller units. As the eldest son of a clan head grew to adulthood, he went off to settle his own crop, and a new junior clan was born, for his father's clan remained senior and its headship passed to his, the eldest son of the great wife. The pa that pattern of segmentation was possible so long as population density was low and land was plentiful for farming and grazing. Under those circumstances, there was little competition for resources and political power, and wars were hardly any more dangerous than a game of football in Latin America. Usually a clan had traditional rivalry with another given clan. They knew each other well, and their champions fought in a spirit of festivity. One or two might have been killed, but then everyone went home until the rematch. Early in the 19th century, the casual temple of a Muzalu life and politics had changed considerably. A greater population meant less and less room for junior members to hive off on their own. It meant less grazing land for cattle and disputes over cattle and land. As the Amazulu began to fight more frequently, so they began to feel the necessity to fight more effectively. At the same time, senior clan heads began to recognize the need for a political structure to ensure unity. The maximization of resources and the minimization of its uh, internecine in conflict. Shaka uh, addressed himself to both the military and political problems of Zulu land, which he saw as two sides of the same coin. Uh, he thought that the centralizing political nucleus should achieve military superiority and demonstrate it to other sectors. That would generally lead to peaceful acceptance of the greater political state, or else the descendants would be uh, thoroughly crushed. The era of conflict and warfare in Zululand in the early 19th century brought troops to face much more often, but the pattern of military uh, encounters still remained at the long distance of hurling of light, um, umganto, or spears. For close fighting, a weapon grasp in the hands is much more damaging as feudal armies discovered in Europe and Asia, and therefore resorted to a sword and pike. Shaka, while serving as a young soldier, came up with the solution of devising uh, a heavy short assegai, which was uh, used purely for stabbing rather than throwing. In addition, he discarded the loose sandal so as to achieve more speed and close with the enemy and more dexterity at close quarters. Through experience, Shaka and his fellow um, youth then discovered the specific techniques of using their shields and assegais uh, to best effect. Of course, warfare comprises not just the encounter of individual soldiers, but more importantly, uh, a pattern of tactics and strategy in relationship uh, to the opposing forces taken as a whole. Um, this aspect of war also attracted Shaka's attention and his outstanding innovation uh, came in the form of Nzimpi, which are regiments deployed so as to allow for a reserve behind the fighting vanguard and for two wings were horns capable of encircling the enemy's flanks. Finally, and most importantly, an army has to be trained disciplined, and organized so that it is a meaningful unit in peace and in war. Shaka created new regiments to include men up to 40 years of age. He kept his Nzimpi on constant exercises and fatigues so that the individual soldier was fit and proficient while the army as a whole synchronized in accordance with the wishes of its commanders. The Zulu army was more than a fighting force. It was an educational institution for the young and an instrument for building loyalties that cut across clans and could be considered as national. Promotion came through merit and not through clan or regional origin. The um, enforced use of the branch of the family of Yoni 
languages also worked in the direction of national consciousness over an area of 12,000 square miles. Citizens came to call themselves Amazulu and to relegate their clan names to second place. Over a much larger area still, Zulu influence was profoundly felt. Policies such as curbing the excesses of witchcraft, the viners, uh, Ezonusi, and the fact that Zulu land became free of internal struggles led to an influx of population from outside its boundaries. A positive contribution to the resources of the Zulu state, uh, European travelers, let's see. Okay. Uh, European travelers who have written um, accounts of Zululand in Shaka's time were impressed by the cleanliness, as they were in Benin in the 15th century. And they were equally struck by the social order, absence of death, uh, a sense of security, just like the Arabs who traveled in the Western Sudan during its period of imperial greatness. In actual fact, both the cleanliness and the security of life and property were part of Zulu life from long before. And under Shaka, what was impressive was the scale on which uh, these uh, things extended, owing to the protective umbrella of the state. Uh, the people being impressed were Europeans, and Europeans' evidence is the best evidence in that it can scarcely be said to have been pro-African propaganda. One white visitor who saw a march past the 15th of Shaka regiments wrote that, it was a most exciting scene, surprising to us, who could not have imagined that a nation of turned savages uh, could be so disciplined and kept in order. A great deal more could be added concerning Amazulu institutions and its army. But what is relevant here is to understand why Ashaka was uh, possible in Africa in the 19th century before the coming of colonial rule. Had Shaka been a slave to some um, cotton planter in Mississippi or some sugar planter in Jamaica, he might have had an ear or a hand chopped off and being a Parentheses, close parentheses, recalcitrant nigger, recalcitrant nigger, rather, or at best he might have distinguished himself in leading a slave revolt. For the only great men among the unfree and the oppressed are those who struggle to destroy the oppressor. On a slave plantation, Shaka would have would not have built a Zulu army and a Zulu state. That much is certain. Nor could any uh. African build anything during the colonial period, however made much a genius he may have been. As it was Shaka, was a herdsman and a warrior. As a youth, he tended cattle on the uh, open plains, free to develop his own potential and apply to it to his environment. Shaka was able to invest his talents and creative energies in a worthwhile endeavor of construction. He was not concerned with fighting for or against slave traders. He was not concerned with the problem of how to resell goods made in Sweden and France. He was concerned with how to develop the Zulu Arca within the limits imposed uh, by his people's resources. It must be recognized that such thing, that things such as military techniques were responses to real needs, that the work of the individual originates in and is backed by the action of society as a whole, and that whatever was achieved by any one leader must have been bounded by historical circumstances and the leader of the, and the level of development which determine the extent to which an individual can first discover, then augment, and then display his potential. Okay. To substantiate the above points, it can be noted that Shaka was challenged to create the heavy stabbing asagai. Uh, when he realized the throwing spear broke when he, when he used as a stabbing weapon. More important still, what Shaka came up with depended upon a collective effort of the Amazulu. Shaka could act that a better assegai be forged because the uh, Amayoni had been working iron for a long time, especially as blacksmiths had arisen within certain clans. It was a tribute to the organizational and agricultural capacity of the society as a whole that it could feed and maintain a standing army of 30,000 30, men, re-equip them with iron weapons, and issue each other with the full-length Zulu shield made from cattle hide. Because the scientific basis and experimental preconditions were um, lacking in Zulu society, Shaka could not have devised a firearm, uh, no matter how much genius he possessed. But he could get his people to forge better weapons, as we explained above. And he found them receptive to better selective breeding practices where he set up a special royal herds, because the people already had a vast fund of empirical knowledge about cattle and a love of the cattle herding profession. 
in the political um, military sphere, uh, Shaka was formed following in the footsteps of his original protector, uh, Dengue Zawaya, and to some extent in the footsteps of Zawidi, who was a rival to both um, Dengue Zawaya and Shaka. Uh, Dengue Zawaya opened up trade with the Portuguese at the Lagoa Bay in, in 1797, mainly in ivory, and he stimulated uh, arts and crafts. He most distinguished innovation. His most distinguished innovation was in the army when he instituted a system of recruiting regiments according to age grades. Previously, each locality tended to dominate within a given regiment. And in any event, people were accustomed to fighting side by side with members of their own crawl, locality, and clan. However, when all men in a given age grade were brought into the same regiment, this emphasized the greater national feeling and also increased. Uh, Digazawayo's power vis a vis the uh, smaller clan heads. Digazawayo uh, was head of the important uh, Ama uh, Thwatwa clan, and he succeeded in establishing his paramountcy in what later became the southern portion of Zululand. In the north, Zwide of the Ama uh, the Wandwe was also engaging in political consolidation. Shaka served in one of the junior age grade regiments of Dingazawayo and remained faithful to the latter's centralizing power until Dingazawayo met his death at the hands of Zawade in 1818. Uh, therefore, thereafter, Shaka took up many uh, of the military and political techniques of Dingazawayo and greatly improved them. That is development. It is a matter of building upon what is inherited and advancing slowly, provided that no one comes to quote unquote, or parenthesis, quote parenthesis. Sibilachi. Uh, yeah. Jeez, he was he was spitting some fire in that part of the section, y'all. Let's talk about it a little bit. So right off the bat, let's just establish like he's 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 establishing this reality that Africans are very much responding to like material conditions of uh of of their region of the part of the nation in which they find themselves in and like apparently nobody did it better than Shaka he's talking about adjusting certain kinds of weapons um that are not so good for stabbing and turning them into long range weapons that might be more so good uh, in that context uh one of the super important things that I don't know I don't know if y'all who have been listening or following along with the with the uh neo-colonialism reading caught it but i caught it so he was mentioning how due to the lack of scientific understanding of how to do so uh shaka could not devise a firearm right but when we read um, when we read neo-colonialism uh kwame was t teaching us how development of firearms themselves was something that the Europeans was purposely keeping uh, from us. They uh, would develop on themselves and then sell them at exorbitant rates uh, when they got back, but they would never teach Africans how to do it themselves because they did not want to be frozen out of that market. Uh, further, made, uh, further laid to bear when you consider this other thing that he was talking about. Uh, he mentions... Let's see, where did he mention ivory? He had mentioned uh, that one of the uh, resources being uh, taken out of Africa uh, was ivory. He said it was actually chiefly ivory. And one of the things that we had learned in um, neocolonialism is that ivory itself was like a resource that, according to Europeans and even seeming to be substantiated by Kwame Nkrumah, that ivory itself wasn't being uh, developed into much of anything, if anything at all. Uh, so um, the uh, Europeans would take ivory, uh, mold it into whatever they would uh, mold it into, and then and then sell that back. But they would they would do this in place of any kind of like firearms training, any kind of building up of a firearm economy in Africa. Not to say that they sold no guns to Africans, more so, like we mentioned, to 
halt any kind of like revolt, any kind of like uh, scientific development, any kind of like scientific uh, renaissance, so to speak, you know, across the motherland. Like this was their intention. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, Africa being deprived of guns just ends up coming off as particularly more dastardly when you understand the context that Europeans definitely, techni- uh, definitely intentionally prevented Africans from being able to produce guns. So, you know, and we know how important that would have been to what it was that we need to achieve for not only Africa, but for our prospects for making revolution across the whole world, uh, and especially for the African diaspora. Uh, it said he was not concerned with fighting for or against slave traders. He was not concerned with the problem of how to resell goods made in Sweden and France. He was concerned with how to develop the Zulu Arca with the limits imposed by his people's resources. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that part because, you know, not concerned with uh, fighting against slave traders is probably something that necessarily uh, I mean that cost a lot of Africans you know their freedom you know had there been any kind of united front uh, to beat back these damn colonizers you know our material situation may have been different but at the same time you know what does it fall on one man to uh, deal with the reality of these fucking colonizers and these slave traders so I suppose he can't necessarily be blamed for that but it is something to meditate on uh he said on a slave plantation, Shaka would not have built a Zulu army in a Zulu state. That much is cert- certain. Nor could any African build anything during a colonial period, however much a genius he may have been. As it was, Shaka's- Shaka was a herdsman and a warrior. As a youth, he tended to cattle on the open plains, free to develop his own potential and apply it to his environment. Colonialism itself, I'm not sure if he's saying it stifles creativity or he's more so getting at the material reality that it doesn't matter how creative you are you're not you're not even allowed to de- you're not allowed to create you're not allowed to develop you're not allowed to build you're just you know unless it's in the interest of um, the colonizers or, you know, of, of these Europeans and um, these uh, at a certain point these Americans you know so that's extremely important you know, Shaka Zulu seems to have just been a person who was in touch with the reality of his situation uh, and it's uh, it's very important to um, keep that in mind. So we can read this conclusion, and then we'll just go ahead and wrap up. Uh, so the conclusion, well, yeah, that was a um, that was a good chapter. Uh, just getting into a lot of good detail as to the like material differences between different parts of Africa is going to do a whole lot for folks to be able to understand exactly what it is Africa is working with when it comes to trying to get themselves out from the colonial construct. So I appreciate Rodney for that. So the conclusion, the regions of Yoruba land, the Home, the inner Ligustrian kingdoms of Zulu land, which have so far been discussed are examples of leading forces in the political development, which was taking place in Africa right up to the eve of colonization. They were not the only leading forces, and even where the states were territorially much smaller, there were observable advances in political organization. Areas of Africa that were most advanced by the 15th century generally maintained their standards, with few exceptions such as Congo. In North Africa and Ethiopia, uh, for example, feudal structures remained intact, though there was a noticeable lack of continued growth. In the Western Sudan, the Hausa states were heirs to the political and commercial tradition of the great empires after the fall of Songhai in the 17th century and early in the 19th century. There arose the Islamic Caliphate Sokoto, which it's with its center in Hausa land. The Sokoto Empire was one of the largest political units ever established on the African to deal with the problem of union leadership of Samori Samo- Turway uh, by the 1880s. Samori Ture was not a scholar like the renowned Uthman, then Fodio, and al Hash Omar, who before him had been creators of Islamic states. But Samori Ture was a military genius and a political innovator who went further than the others in setting up a political administration where a, a, give me a second. All right. Who went further than others in setting up a political administration where a sense of loyalty could prevail over and above clans loyalties and ethnic groups. Zimbabwe uh, too progressed with only slight interference from Europeans. Uh, 
Locally, the center of power shifted from Utapa to Changanere, and eventually in the 19th century, um, uni groups fleeing from the power of the Zulu overran Zimbabwe. So long as the uni um, or warrior bands of the mar- on the march, they obviously proved destructive, but by the middle of the 19th century, the uni had already uh, spread their own building techniques to Mozambique into what is now southern Rhodesia and had joined with the p- local population uh, to establish new and larger kingdoms and fused with a sense of nationality, as was the case in Zululand. Uh, meanwhile, across vast areas of Central Africa, striking political change was also taking place. Up to the 15th century, the level of social organization was low in the area between Congo and Zimbabwe. Precisely in that area, there arose the groups of states known as the Luba Lunda Complex. Uh, their political structures, rather than their territorial size, made them significant, and their achievements were registered in the face of constantly encroaching slaving activities. On the large island of Madagascar, the several small states of an earlier epoch had, by the late 18th century, given way to the powerful feudal Merlina kingdom. More often than not, Madagascar is ignored in general assessments of the African continent. Although, both in the physical and cultural sense, Africa is writ large on the Malagasy people. Uh, they too suffer from a lost population through slave exports, but the Marina Kingdom did better than most slaving states because more intensive cultivation of high yielding swamp rice and the breeding of cattle offset the loss of labor. The situation uh, should serve as a reminder that development uh, accompanied by slave trading must not be superficially and illogically attributed to the export of the population and dislocation attendant upon slave raiding. The basis of the political development of the Marina Kingdom and of all uh, others, whether or not engaged in slaving, lay in their own environment, in the material resources, human resources, technology, and social relations. So long as any African society could at least maintain its inherited advantages springing from many centuries of evolutionary change, therefore so long could the superstructure continue to expand and give further opportunities to whole groups of people, to classes, and to individuals. At the beginning of this section, attention was drawn to the necessity uh, for reconciling a recognition of American African development or African development up to 1885 with an awareness of the losses simultaneously incurred by the continent in that epoch due to the nature of the contact with capitalist Europe. That issue must also be explicitly alluded to at this point. It is clearly ridiculous to assert that contact with Europe built or benefited Africa in the pre-colonial period nor does it represent reality to suggest, as President Leopold Senghor once did, that the slave trade uh, swept Africa like a bushfire, leaving nothing standing. The truth is that a developing Africa went into slave trading in European commercial relations as into a gale force wind, which shipwrecked a few societies, set many others off course, and generally slowed down the rate of events. However, Pursuing the metaphor further, it must be noted that African captains were still making decisions before 1885, though already forces were at work which caused European capitalists to insist on and succeed in taking over command. All right, so we've wrapped up 4.3. So Zoe said, when they were directly colonized, the African people were not able to build anything because the colonizers deprived them of the physical means to do so. Yeah, exactly, Zoe. The, um, like I said, we understand what the excess... Of uh, or what the overabundance of ivory ended up leading to, you know, that ended up being the main resource that the Europeans seemed to target, and you know, had they wanted to facilitate a relationship of friendship and all this other shit that they like to preach, you know, they would have like been informing Africans of what it was they could have been doing with the what they could have been doing with that ivory, but instead they decided to enter into an exploitative relationship uh, with the name um, in the name of profit, you know, because this is just what the logic of colonization necessarily entails. So it's no surprise that um, building anything, developing anything at all, and that wasn't, you know, profitable to the European was something that if you are living in a colonized area of the um, continent, it's going to be, bordering on impossible uh, for you. Okay, y'all. So we've wrapped up 4.3. I'm not sure if 4.4 is the last part of chapter four. Uh, Yeah, it does look to be the last one. So yeah, we'll wrap up chapter 4.4.
next week and or 4.4 next week and then the week after that we'll be finally ready to start chapter five so we're making a lot of good progress and i'm very appreciative being here with us so uh we'll be starting this week we'll 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 do we'll be doing chapter four of women racing class next uh tomorrow then this saturday at 11 a.m and 2 p.m est we'll be doing inventing reality by michael parenti um, so that's going to be two chances to check that out. We're not going to be doing that late afternoon slot anymore because that just didn't seem to work for most comrades. Uh, and then, of course, we'll continue neocolonialism next week as well. So until then, comrades, y'all know I love y'all. Solidarity always. And I'll see y'all next week for the Walter Rodney um, Section 4.4 reading. Y'all take care.